nice. <laughs> Um, okay, so I'm going to just have these. I think I'm going to be able to just let these run through. I'm not sure about that. I'll click it every once in a while. Um, so when Angie asked me a couple of months ago if I would share this story, um, I agreed immediately. Um, I knew that uh, I had been asking God since the very beginning that he wouldn't allow this pain to be wasted. And I knew that this would be part of that answer to that prayer being able to share this story. Um, to say I have regretted it every day since is not really an understatement. Um, the preparing for this was harder than I could have ever imagined. Um, I've spent the last month reliving this season and I have gotten the wonderful, beautiful opportunity to remember God's goodness to remember his grace and remember his faithfulness in the darkest of times. But I've also gotten to remember the pain. I've also gotten to remember that spirit-crushing, soul-piercing pain. So uh, it's been a difficult month. It's been a very difficult journey just, just preparing for tonight. So I ask you to please have grace be patient with me. Um, is I'm gonna I'm gonna fumble my way through this as best as I can. So, okay. <clears throat> the theme of this series is great grief and gratitude. Those are two words that don't really go together very well in my mind. Um, having walked through the valley of grief, I uh, don't grief gratitude was not one of the words that I would have used didn't even really make the top 10. <clears throat> there are lots of words that I, uh, I would have used instead. Um, and I, it's, I love so much that you're talking about hope. I wish so much I had been here last week to have heard that. Um, and, uh, you'll see why here in just a minute. <laughs> um, when we began 2017, everything was on track to be a great year. Uh, Rusty and I were getting ready to empty nest. We had uh, bought matching Harleys, and we just we had all the plans, right? We were gonna it, we were gonna do it big. Uh, Haley had just gotten married. She had a wonderful husband, uh, working at uh, as a producer at KETK. Great job. Emily was in college. She was uh, studying to be a teacher. She uh, she still lived at home, but she was saving to uh, to move out. Uh, had really big plans. Uh, at the time, I was the uh, women's ministry coordinator here at Flint. Had had that role for several 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 years, um, but God had, had me step down early in the spring of 2017. Uh, didn't really understand why at the time. Um, I knew that there were big plans in the in the works. I knew God had had great plans for me. My job at the time wasn't great. Um, had some really bad leadership in my company, and so when I stepped down, I just knew that God planned to let me move back into ministry at some point. He was going to let me quit my job and have Angie's job. <laughs> uh, our plans are not the same as God's always. Um, most often, it seems like my plans are, are much less than God's plans, and in this case, it was very, very different plans. I have tried unsuccessfully most of my life to journal. I would do great for a day or two and forget for a year. I'm just not good at this. <laughs> I've tried and tried and tried. Um, the only time I have been even remotely successful was during this period, and God allowed me to use this to work through some feelings and thoughts and just sort through things. And so rather than trying to explain to you or, or tell the story of where I was and what was happening, um, I'm going to just read you some of my journal entries. Uh, they're very raw, and they're very, very real. Okay. Okay. Monica, they're asking if you could speak up just a little bit in the back. I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, I can. Okay. Let me get a drink and I will okay. speak up. I said I was calm, but my resting heart rate and my dry <laughs> mouth says otherwise. Okay. I will try to speak up. So, we'll start here. Uh, the first entry, January 20th, 2017. Today marks day seven. Day seven since my heart stopped beating. Day seven since my world failed to rotate. 
day seven since my precious little Emily left me. I know all the correct answers and even believe them most of the time. But then there are other times that all I know to be true is this pain. The pain so deep that I can't breathe. So deep I fear it will consume my soul. My memory of that week is foggy at best. The days have blurred into a mashed up collage of thoughts. All but Sunday, that is. We had stayed in a hotel in Ardmore Saturday night after visiting Rusty's aunt and uncle. We drove to Dallas to do some shopping before coming home. We spent some time at Bass Pro Shop buying Emily's birthday present. Her daddy got her a till fishing pole. She would have loved that. We talked to her on the phone while we shopped. She told her daddy about taking care of the chickens. He told her about the fish fryer he was buying. She told me about the, her bubble bath the night before. She used a bath bomb, but not the glittery ones, because you can't see the glitter in the bubbles. We went to Grapevine Mills Mall. We only stayed a few minutes. I bought all the girls Vera Bradley bags. She had planned to get up early Sunday morning and get a bunch of stuff done before going to work, but she overslept. She did her laundry, but that's it. She accidentally turned her white work shirts blue. <laughs> I think she washed them with her jeans, which was a real knucklehead thing to do. In fact, that was my last text to her, asking her if she washed her jeans and her shirts. She never answered. We stopped for Mexican food in Canton, got super irritated at the waiter for not bringing us chips. Something was off, but we just didn't understand. We thought it was just the waiter. While we were complaining about our waiter, our little girl was dying. There was a terrible storm rolling through with torrential rain. She drove to work on FM 2868. Church Road, as the girls called it. She hydroplaned. She crossed the center line and hit head on another car. Both the other driver and Emily died instantly. The passenger in the other car is injured badly, but will recover. When we got home, we still had no idea that anything had happened. We probably drove by 2868 about the time the tow truck got there. I went to the grocery store to get things ready for the weekend, or for the week ahead, and just finished unloading the car and started prepping lunches when the doorbell rang. I thought it was our neighbor. I almost grabbed a carton of eggs to give to him. It wasn't the neighbor. It was the highway patrol. When Rusty came back in, I told him to grab the eggs and run them over to Burl. He waved me off and said, in a minute. He went to the backyard without saying anything else to me. Started to follow him out, <clears throat> but then I saw him bent over. I knew something was horribly wrong, but I didn't venture to believe just how horribly wrong it could be. I'm standing by the bar watching him through the door when he comes back in. He grabs hold of me and says, she's gone. I remember screaming for him to tell me where my baby is. Screaming for him to stop lying to me. Screaming for him to bring me to her. Screaming for him to help me understand. Just screaming. It starts to blur then. I remember people coming over, but I couldn't tell you who. I remember my precious preacher. I remember telling my precious preacher that whatever it was he was trying to tell me for comfort wasn't working. I remember telling my sweet friend to stop talking. I remember telling everyone that God's grace was not sufficient, that he had lied. But that's really all I can remember from that night. The other memories are very scattered and fragmented. Telling Robert and Judy not to preach, that I know the right answers, but they sure don't feel very right. I remember wanting to die, believing if I could, I could will myself to stop breathing if I could just focus enough. Oh, how my heart aches even still as I relive those hours. It seems as if minutes ticked by so slowly. The days seemed to last weeks. I feared sleep for when I did doze off and awoke, I had to relive it again as I realized it wasn't just a horrible nightmare. 
Those first few mornings were so dreadful as we laid in bed holding one another and wept. We wept over what had been lost. Her daddy will never walk her down the aisle. I will never hold her babies. We wept over what we hadn't done with her and those things we regretted. We wept over what we might have done to change the course so she would still be alive. We wept for the light that was gone, the hopelessness that enveloped us. Oh, how dark those hours were. How dark our hearts as our vision clouded with doubts of God's goodness and fears of our failings. But today is day seven. We've experienced every possible emotion you can imagine, had every conceivable what-if scenario played out in our minds, questioned every belief we've ever held so tightly up to this point. Today the house is quiet as all the family and friends have gone home. Today is almost normal if normal included a gaping wound in my chest. I am broken and I am weak. <clears throat> August 27th, 2017. Two weeks, 14 days. Seems like an eternity since I last saw my sweet girl. Since I last took a breath without an ache in my chest. Only two weeks. I'm going to church for the first time since the accident. I'm afraid to go, which is so very strange. Flint is my very most favorite place to be. I love the people there. I love being there. But this morning, I'm afraid. I'm afraid everyone will stare or want to tell me again how sorry they are. Or worse, they'll act like it never happened. I'm afraid they'll be watching us and I won't react the way I should. I'm afraid that if they look too closely in my eyes, they won't see hope. They'll see this gaping wound in my heart, the fear and the sadness. So the first words I think of when I reread those first two entries um, is not, not gratitude. It is broken. It is brokenness. My perfect little family was shattered. The dreams that we had for our future were just destroyed in one moment. But... God, in his infinite mercy, chose to give me a new word. He chose to give me the word hope. Okay, August 13th. I'm actually going to find this picture. Hang on. Is it? I don't know how to get back to the start. Back to the start this way. So you get to see all of them again. This picture. August 13th, 2013. Four years to the day, four years to the day, almost to the hour before this accident, Emily got a tattoo. Now I understand there's not everyone agrees with the whole idea of tattoos. I get it. It's, I get it. Um, but God so used this, and he's still to this day using this. Um, she had been begging her daddy for a tattoo forever. She was old enough to get one, but she lived in our house. You know, my house, my rules. And his rule was no. Uh, but she begged and begged and begged. And he had read somewhere that one of the most painful places to get a tattoo is on the top of your foot. <laughs> so he finally relented and said, sure, as long as you get it on the top of your foot. <laughs> Thinking that was going to help deter her, it did not. And anyone who ever met Emily knows it, wouldn't, it wasn't even a thing for her. Uh, she searched and searched and searched trying to come up with exactly the right tattoo, exactly what she wanted, something that was meaningful, um, that she wouldn't regret, that you know, was just, it was exactly the perfect one. And she finally settled on a, an anchor with the word steadfast hope. <clears throat> Goodness. As I sorted through those pictures after the accident, this is the one I found. This is her getting that tattoo. Four years to the day, almost the hour, God allowed her to stamp hope on her foot, knowing he was going to use this to stamp hope on my heart. He is so good. <clears throat> so the phrase uh, steadfast hope comes from Hebrews 9, uh, 619. But I want to read 618 as well. Um, it wasn't until just the recent years that 618 really 
really impacted me or I understood really the impact of it. Um, so let me read this real quick. God has given us both his promise and his oath. Therefore, we who have run to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a sure and steadfast anchor for the soul. Over the next year, of course, the next year, um, we got so many messages uh, from friends, from families. Uh, every time someone sees an anchor, they think of us. They think of my Emily, and they think of hope. Actually, this building was our Sunday school class at the time of the accident. Um, it wasn't, hadn't, didn't have a name at the time, and it wasn't just very long after that they named it the Hope Building. Probably coincidence. I like to think not, but it might have been. Uh, but that wasn't the only word he gave us. Hope was the first word he gave us, but it wasn't the only word. <clears throat> Day 15 looking to God for help, for answers, because there is nowhere else to look, and he is silent. If I thought even for a moment that there was somewhere else to go for what only he can supply, I'd look there, but there isn't. Why then does he remain far off? My little girl will never again send me a silly text. She will never again walk through that door. She will never again tell me she loves me. And it seems to, and he seems to be oblivious. My heart is shattered in a million pieces, and he is either impotent to help or just doesn't want to. I hate this feeling. I hate these thoughts. I know they aren't true, but I am powerless to stop them. I have been fighting to hold on to the truth I know, but I am failing. This foundation of truth doesn't seem strong enough to bear this burden. But without this truth, I have nothing to hold on to, no hope. Nothing. I feel like I'm grasping a weather-beaten, frayed rope, trusting it to hold me while watching the fibers snap one at a time, waiting for the last one to break and drop me into the abyss. Yes, he had given me hope, but that wasn't all I needed. September 1st, 2017. Day 19. Once again, I know the truth. The truth that once I staked my very life on, the truth that I once taught women with such conviction, the truth that I knew would stand forever and never change. How is it then that with all this knowledge I am still so very confused? Is it my understanding of God that's still messed up? Is it that I'm trying to make him fit into a mold of him, recreating God in my image? If that's the case, how do I change it? How do I see him as he is and not tainted by the pain and the sorrow? How do I see him without the shadow of death and doubt clouding my vision? I long to trust him again. I long to approach his throne of grace with confidence that he hears me, confidence that he loves me, confidence that he cares, confidence that he is able to fix this, confidence that he will. I long to lift my hands in praise to him again. I long to tell of his goodness, of his love, of his faithfulness and power. I long to walk closely with him in, in love and adoration rather than shrinking from him in fear and doubt. I can make the choice to trust him, but there remains this nagging doubt in the shadows of my mind. If he wouldn't protect my baby girl when I trusted him to, how can I trust him with anything else? This isn't a simple case of mind over matter. I can't will myself to trust him and really mean it as long as that shadow remains. Can I trust him to rid me of the doubt? Here's where he gave me the next word. He gave me the word truth. See, before the accident, I had all the answers. I knew. I knew. Uh, I knew God's word, and I believed it. At least I thought I did. Um, there's a big difference between knowing something and fully putting your weight into something. You know, I've heard the sermons myself, and I thought I understood them. I didn't understand them. Now I understand them. Um, I'd spent years telling women that God's truth is that God's truth is enough, that there is not a battle they will ever fight, that his, his truth, his word cannot defeat that lie. Uh, name, the, name the lie, insert the truth. 
I cannot even begin to count the number of times I said that in the years leading up to this accident. I had taught God's word, and I truly believed that it was the plumb line for our lives. I truly believed that it was absolute truth. But in the deepest, darkest hours of my despair, everything that I knew, everything I was experiencing, did not align with that truth. And this is where the battle starts for the mind. We all know that every spiritual battle begins in our brain, in our mind, our brain, our mind. <laughs> Um, and unfortunately, when we walk through grief, we're not immune to that battle. Unfortunately, the enemy is just as active in our grief as he is in our joy. God has called us to walk by faith when we can't see, but he never told us to walk by faith when we can see. This was very important for me to understand at this time. I needed to know that it wasn't just I believe. There had to be more than just I believe here. God never tells us to check our minds at the door. He never does. In fact, he very adamantly multiple times tells us to engage our minds in worship. He wants us to engage our brains in our relationship with him. Uh, Romans 12 foretold uh, to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Ephesians 4 says to renew our spirit of our minds. 1 Peter 1 says that we are going to prepare our minds for action. God repeatedly tells us to address our minds, not our feelings, not even our faith, but our minds. Um, when your emotions are over here and your experiences are over here, and God's word is over here, and there is no way this is ever going to intersect. There is no way that these two things will ever intersect. You have to have something to bridge that gap. You have to have something that is going to bridge the experience with God's truth. And in my experience, or my faith was not enough. Um... In May before the accident, I had bought tickets for Rusty for his birthday. He turned 50 that year. Actually, he turned 53 days before the accident, or after the accident, sorry. Um, I bought him tickets to the Defending Truth Conference in Tennessee. This conference had four of the most profound apologetic minds of our times. Brilliant, brilliant men that just incredible, incredible lineup. Um, and the conference was 12 weeks after the accident. So let me just read this piece to you. November 6th, 2017, day 85. 12 weeks yesterday, three months, one quarter of a year. My heart is still in pieces. My chest still aches continually. But it's one day closer to seeing my girl again. One day closer to leaving temporary time and entering eternity one day closer to the end of this wicked world and the beginning of paradise. Our weekend at the Defending Truth Conference was beyond anything we could have hoped or imagined. The speakers were phenomenal. I have never been drawn to apologetics in the way Rusty is and fully anticipated being either bored or confused all weekend. I was neither. These great men of God presented truth in such an intelligent, articulate manner that they were captivating without being over my head. Oh, what great truth we heard from the Lord through these men. But the greatest, of course, was Ravi Zacharias, the single most intelligent man I have ever heard speak. As he spoke on Saturday, and we were attentively, we attentively hung on his every word, grace was the overwhelming theme. He appeared to have made con eye contact with Rusty and held his gaze for what seemed like most of the whole talk. And watching the recording yesterday when we returned home, he barely touched on grace, and the captivating period was only a brief moment. <laughs> I am amazed at how the Holy Spirit took what Ravi said and expounded on it in our hearts, if not on video. At the end of the conference, there was a Q&A session with, four, with the four speakers. I had submitted a question because I knew Rusty wouldn't, and oh, how amazing would it be if his hero answered. Out of the hundreds of questions submitted, they chose mine. It was intended to be a theological question about heaven. I didn't frame my question well, and it wasn't interpreted as I intended, but it was exactly as God intended. I was asking for evidence of the reality of heaven, similar to the existence of God, the resurrection, the inerrancy of scripture, other areas of apologetics, but 
Rather than the theological response I had hoped for, Ravi gave a compassionate, gentle, gentle answer that spoke directly to our hearts, reminding us that this, temporary, this is temporary and heaven is eternal, reminding us that God is just and will make all things right, reminding us that God is ever faithful. So <clears throat> along with this incredible moment that we had with, with these speakers, um, this weekend, that weekend was full of tools equipping us to reinforce our faith. Um, so typically when someone talks about apologetics, they're talking about uh, when you're addressing an atheist or a skeptic or something like that. That is not at all how God has used apologetics in my life. Um, he has used it to defend the faith to me in my own heart. He has allowed me to use this as a weapon in my spiritual warfare. Um, these men introduced me to things like the cosmological argument, the moral argument, the, the textual criticism, scripture, the, all, of, all of the things. Um, some of it much more heady than I can ever get into, but most of it is, is really not as hard as it seems at first. Um, why is this important, you ask? Because in the midst of grief, the lie is so easy to believe. It is so much easier to believe the lie when you're walking through the darkness than it is to grab hold of that truth. Uh, Satan's been using doubt of God's word since the garden. Hath God said. And he's using it today. He doesn't have to come up with anything creative because this works. If he can get us to doubt God's word, then all of those precious promises that when we are in the valley of death, when we are in the darkness and the deepest pits of despair that we are trying to hold so desperately to, they become empty. That promise that he will never forsake me. He will never leave me or forsake me. <coughs> that promise that he is near to the brokenhearted. That promise that he will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish me. Those are empty promises if I can't trust his word. And if Satan can get me to question the validity, question the accuracy of God's word, he can empty those promises for me. So I was forced to go back over and over and over again to these same principles to remind myself that God's word is trustworthy, that I don't have to just believe it. I can see that the facts are there, and it is truth. There's just too much evidence that scripture is true for the enemy to be able to use doubts successfully for very long. February 26, 2018. Day 195. At some point last week, Rusty posed the question, when does grief become sin? I resisted it for some time as I do not want to think that at any point the broken heart of a mother for her child could ever become sinful. In fact, it made me rather angry that he said it out loud. But of course, God kept replaying it in my mind until I had to address it. At Feminar this weekend, I believe I heard the answer. Grief becomes sin when I refuse to worship. Even in the midst of my brokenness and pain, I am called to worship. And when I refuse, it's sin. I believe that's why God, is, God chose to use mis music as his method to speak to me these past 195 days. <coughs> Through the music I'm hearing from him, and I'm able to fall on my knees and worship even though my heart is covered in a shroud of despair, I am able to declare his goodness and faithfulness as he wraps his arms around me and draws me close. When I surrender myself completely to the worship, he is glorified and I am comforted. So why then would I ever choose to not worship him? The same reason any other sin would be appealing. It feels natural and easier. It seems only natural to wallow in the grief and wrap myself in pity than, it, than to set it aside and worship. Worship requires shifting my gaze from myself to him, channeling energy into praise rather than pity. This requires effort while wallowing does not. It's easier but far less productive and rewarding. So this is where God gave me the next word, the word worship. Uh, Levi Lusco says, uh, part of the quote is, washing our wounds with worship. When King David, um, when his baby was sick, he sat in sackcloth and ashes. After the baby died, he took a bath, put on clean clothes, and he went to worship. 
he was washing his wounds with worship even then. We're commanded to worship, so that means that we do it even when we don't feel like it. When we raise our hands in worship, when we raise our hands in worship when our heart is breaking, what a beautiful gift that is to our King. What a beautiful sacrifice it is. When worship is truly a sacrifice, I believe it's, I believe it's beautifully accepted. <clears throat> Sorry. So often during this time, I couldn't hear God's voice at all. The only time I could hear him was in, in music. Um, there were so many times I couldn't pray. I had no words to pray, but I could sing. Brother Billy even let me join the choir, even though he knew I couldn't sing. <laughs> um, I know that worship is not just music. I know this. Um, but God used music as the way to, to speak to me. This is where he so lovingly met me so often. He truly washed my wounds with worship. <clears throat> August 3rd, 2018. We're drawing close to the anniversary of my baby girl's departure. The past weeks have been an emotional turmoil that is rivaled only by those early, early weeks. The silence from heaven is deafening. As I have screamed and begged God for, for God's presence and comfort, I've had no response. As I've tried to worship, I've heard nothing. And then it clicks. My walk all these years has been based on my perception of God's goodness. It's a performance-based acceptance rather than on who he is. For the first time in my life, the striving has ceased. The fighting to grow spiritually has ended. The guilt of not doing enough has vaporized and peace has come. After all, who am I to tell the star breather how to God? If God never speaks to me again, he is worthy of my praise. If he never offers another moment's comfort, he is worthy of my praise. If he takes everything and everyone from me, he is worthy of my praise. No matter how he performs, in my opinion, he is worthy of my praise. I will worship him when I don't know his closeness. I will worship him when I don't feel his presence. I will worship him when all seems lost because he is worthy of my worship. He is almighty God who breathes stars. He is a consuming fire dwelling in inapproachable light. He is holy God of all and worthy of praise. There is no amount of worship I could ever heap on him that would ever balance the scale of his worth. Oh, that the rest of my days in these shadow lands could be spent basking in the light of his glory. <clears throat> so God gave me those three words, hope, truth, and worship. Grief is never linear, though, right? So those weren't the only words that I got. Um, those were words God gave me, but those weren't the only words I had. Um, we don't start with the, going through step one, two, three of grief, and you know, once you're finished, you're done. Um, that's not how it works. Grief is not linear. So just because I would have a victory in hope, a victory in truth, um, one day have exactly the same battle the next day and fail. Uh, those that were closest to me got to see that. They got to walk through me th with me through the, uh, through the despair as well as the hope. Um, so fear is one word that I heard a lot. Anxiety, despair, doubt. They were, they were very popular. Um, but hope, truth, and worship won. Not every day. Still not every day. But they win. They win in the end. Okay. <clears throat> the theme tonight is grief and gratitude. I pretty well covered the grief. So we're gonna add, I'm just going to touch on the gratitude real quick as I'm running out of time, I think. Um, these are some things that I thought of as I was putting these notes together uh, that I might not have noticed at the time I was thankful for, but looking back, we can, we can see them much more clearly. Um, a couple years before, actually it was the year before, uh, Emily had bought a new car. She had just put new tires on it just, very, just a couple weeks before uh, the accident. 
she wasn't driving the old Hyundai. Um, everything functioned as it was supposed to. The airbags deployed like they were supposed to. The tires were brand new. They, they did what they were supposed to do. Um, the enemy didn't have the opportunity to say that we were negligent in providing for, that, for her. And for that, I am so, so very thankful. That Sunday night, we didn't go to church. We normally did. We would go just almost every Sunday night, but we chose not to go that night. Had we gone, we probably would have met the tow truck with her car. I am so thankful we didn't go. Haley had just changed jobs the month before. She was working as a producer at the news station, and she, changed, she went to work for the Salvation Army. Had she still been at the news station, she would have heard about the accident there. I am so thankful she wasn't there. Uh, <clears throat> I got to meet Robin. About a year later, a year after the accident, I got to meet Robin. She is the last person to have seen my little girl alive. She got to the car, and Emily was still alive. She opened her eyes. She looked at her, and she just drifted away. She wasn't scared. And she wasn't in pain. And as a mama, you know how thankful I am for that. <clears throat> this one's kind of hard, but she died at the scene of the accident. I didn't get to say goodbye to her, but I also didn't have to make life support decisions. I am so thankful God <laughs> made that choice for me and didn't make me have to do that. As we were driving to the funeral home on the night of her visitation, Seth was driving, and the radio was on, just barely audible. You could just barely hear it. And as we're pulling onto Grande, going to Stewart, home by Chris Tomlin was on. I am so thankful that God chose that moment to remind me of eternity. As we were going to see the casket where my little girl was laying, I was reminded that this is temporary and that she is home. We have anchors in Hebrews 619 in every room in our house, except the bathroom. <laughs> they are all gifts from friends and family throughout the years. We went, to, we went to grief counseling for two years. Anyone who is walking through grief today, I cannot, I cannot recommend counseling enough. Um, two weeks after the accident, I convinced Rusty we needed to go. And he was a little hesitant at first, and then a couple months into it, I'm like, okay, we've had enough. We can quit. It's not helping us anymore. And he insisted we continue going, and I am so thankful that he did. Having the opportunity to go to this safe place where we can scream and we can yell and we can, we can curse. Sometimes we cursed even. And we found hope. We found strength. We found encouragement. Um, I am so thankful that we continued for, actually the last visit was on the two-year anniversary of the accident, and I am so grateful for that. I am thankful for smartphones. We have thousands of pictures of my girl. This was taken the Sunday before the accident in the old sanctuary. We have thousands and thousands of pictures. As a child of the 80s, I can probably count on my fingers the number of pictures I have. <laughs> we have thousands. Um, I am thankful for Facebook memories. Emily was a firecracker. Uh, Haley actually wrote her obituary for me, and that's how she described her. Our firecracker covered in glitter. So when those Facebook memories pop up and I get to see some of the things that she said and did, it brings me such joy. So I am so thankful for social media. Um, I had been ready to leave my job. I told you the, the leadership there was not, not the best and things were just, it was just not fun anymore. It wasn't, wasn't a great job. It wasn't horrible, but it wasn't great. And I was, I was ready to leave. Um, of course, God had other plans for me there. Uh, he brought in new leadership at my company. I actually ended up getting a promotion and now I lead women, a lot of them. Wasn't exactly the women's ministry I planned on, but it's exactly what God knew I needed. Um, <clears throat> Romans 8.29. Everyone's super familiar with 8.28. 
that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Well, I'm telling you, you're walking through that despair, you're walking through that grief, there is nothing good. There is nothing good about burying a little girl. There is nothing good about burying a child. So on isolation, that verse seems very unrealistic. It doesn't seem believable. But when you add verse 29 to that, that God is using all of these horrible, awful things that I hate so much to mold me more into the image of his son, that is good. And for that, I am thankful. I had 23 years, 11 months, and 10 days being Emily's mommy on this side of heaven. And I am thankful for every single one of them. That's all I have. <laughs>